Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And as you're getting your Bible, you want to have one for your Bible study, maybe a pad and a pen or pencil so you take, take notes. Some notes. I will greet you in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, on behalf of myself, Alice, and the Bible Talk ministry. Hallelujah. As we continue on... In our study, we're in the Sermon on the Mount, been in the Sermon on the Mount for quite a number of weeks now, and we're kind of getting down towards the end of the Sermon on the Mount. We're in the seventh chapter of Matthew, so you can go ahead and turn to that, as we're going to look at, starting at verse 12, Matthew seven twelve is where we'll start, right after Alice asks God's blessing on our time together today. Hallelujah. Father, we come before you with thanksgiving in our hearts, and we praise you and thank you for all that you're doing for us. We thank you for your love. Yes, we thank you for the word that you've given us, and we thank you, Lord, for each and every heart out there that's preparing to receive it. We ask that the word which we know will go forth and accomplish what you want it to do, Lord. And we ask that you would touch Alan's heart in the words that he speaks or what you put there. Yes, Lord. And we ask all of this in the precious name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. All right, we ended our program last week talking about uh, seeking, asking for, seeking, and receiving the Holy Spirit. Then Jesus goes on to say, Matthew 7, 12, mm -hmm. In everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets. This statement is kind of the summary of the entire teaching here in the Sermon on the Mount. See, now I don't believe in a social gospel. Uh, that said, I believe that the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, has to impact our relationship with the society that we live in. Right. Right? We are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. It has to have impact there. But here in this teaching, Jesus spoke of the blessings that are, are, are the, for the gentle, the merciful, the peacemakers. When we forgive others, when we're the light of the world, when we're the salt of the earth, when we treat others as we should. Mm -hmm. That's treating them with grace, not based on what they deserve. Thank God every day you don't get what you deserve. Amen. You know, people ask me all the time, they, or they'll say, God bless you. And I say, he does. Continually. Mm -hmm more than I deserve. I thank God that he doesn't bless me as I deserve, all right? Mm. Whatever you do, Paul wrote to the Colossians, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not to men, right. right? So when you're showing grace to people, that was Colossians 3, 23, by the way, when you're, when you're showing grace to people, you're doing it as unto the Lord. Do you remember that he said that on that day, you came and visited me when I was sick, when I was in jail, and you said, when did we do this, Lord? He said, what you've done to the least of my brethren, you've done unto me. Our purpose here on this planet is to bring God's love, his light, his grace, his power into a world that is darkened by sin. Mm. This requires not only treating others as we want them to treat us, but treating them as we have been treated. Because hallelujah, we've been treated, treated with, with those things We've been forgiven, and we are to forgive. We have the power to do that because the love of God has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, as Paul said in Romans 5. And as he wrote to, to the church at Corinth, when he said, love does not take into account a wrong suffered, and love never fails. 1 Corinthians 13, that was verse 5 and verse 8, right? That is the law and the prophets. Yes. That is, that, the law and the prophets, I mean, that's like saying, that's the entire word of God. Okay? That's the, that is the summary of the word of God. That's the whole revelation of God from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. Mm -hmm. Revelation 22, from the beginning to the end. It encompasses all of the Lord's instruction on how we are to live. Remembering that this message, as we have often noted before, is directed to believers. Yes. The Sermon on the Mount was spoken to believers. Now, there were others there listening in, mm -hmm. all right? Mm -hmm. But 
he is speaking to his disciples, disciples right. right? So we have an assumption that we already love God, right? And therefore, we're obeying the great commandment, the Shema. Yes. Shema Yisrael, okay? A man came to Jesus. I'm going to read to you from Matthew 22, 36 to 40. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. You see, keeping that yes. will fulfill what James calls the royal law, the law of love. Mm -hmm. James 2.8, if you want to go read it. <laughs> Sermon on the Mount, which is Jesus' first instruction to his disciples, training them in righteousness before sending them out. Okay, this is the first time he's got it. Prior to this, he has gone out and he has he has preached the kingdom. He has preached repentance. Right. And that the kingdom of God is at hand, right? And people now are choosing to follow him. It is those who have chosen to follow him who have accepted him that he is now speaking to, right? Mm -hmm. So before sending them out, he's teaching them first and foremost to focus on relationship rather than the rituals and the religiosity that they had known all their lives. Mm -hmm. He's changing this. That's why he said, right? You have heard it said, but I say to you. This is, it starts with, this is a relationship with Yahweh. God, our Father, based on his love, not on the works that they did. Then, relationship with others, saints and sinners, friends and foes, those who love you and those who hate you, and those who persecute you. That's what he was saying. You've heard it said, but I say to you. It's about relationship. That is the key to understanding. I was going to say understanding the Sermon on the Mount. That's, that's the key to understanding the heart of God. Right. It's all about relationship. You know, I think I may have mentioned it last week. I, whether I did or not, it doesn't matter. I'm going to mention it again. Jesus grew up. He was a carpenter. Mm -hmm. He could repair stuff. Mm -hmm. He had a broken table brand to Jesus. He can fix it. He can repair it. You, you, right? Yes. Well, think of that. those words. Because you see, sin had separated man from God the Father. Jesus came along and repaired us with the Father. We are now paired once again, joined with the Father through the atoning work, the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So, he who is the way, the truth, and the life truly shows the way to life. What's the way to life? Well, look at the next verse. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are few who find it. Matthew, that's 13 and 14, right? So first of all, recognize this. David wrote in the Psalms and he said, he restores my soul. He restores my soul. Mm -hmm. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Psalm 23, 3. The Lord leads us on that narrow way that leads to the small gate that leads us to life. Mm -hmm. And only a few find. Think, just think about this. Now, again, make, make notes of this and go check this out. Read them and read what goes before them and after them. Get the context, all right? The prophet Isaiah, God spoke to the prophet Isaiah in chapter 35, verse 8, and he said this, A highway will be there, a roadway, and it will be called the highway of holiness. The unclean will not travel on it, but it will be for him who walks that way, and fools will not wander on it. Mm. This, is, this is this path that leads to life. This narrow path that we're talking about is going to be called the highway of holiness. Hallelujah. That said, I want to tell you right now, I caution you, it may be a bumpy road. 
you know, we're, we're here in England, and it's the roads, I was going to say they're like the United States of America, mm. but that wouldn't be quite true. Mm. Here in the UK, they have motorways, which are kind of the equivalent of our interstate highways in the United States. Mm -hmm. Nice and wide and broad and easy to travel. And here in the UK, they have country lanes <laughs> that, that are often uh, very, very twisty, narrow. very, very narrow. Yeah. Narrow yes. enough so that as you're coming around a curve, you better be very prayerful in your driving because the roads are not big enough for two vehicles, yeah. although it's two-way traffic, all right? We live, we are blessed to live. Remember, it was God who determines our times and the boundaries of our habitation. We are blessed to live in the perilous last days. Yes. And there is peril, you know, but there's been peril for the believer for a long time. David wrote in Psalm 34, verse 19, he said, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Thank you, Lord. And that, that way, we're talking about bumpy roads, okay? Because you have an enemy out there who's trying to make this difficult for you, okay? But Jesus said his burden is light, his yoke, right? Is easy and his burden is light. I'm going to go back to the prophet Isaiah. And in Isaiah 26, verse 7, it says, The way of the righteous is smooth. Mm -hmm. O upright one, make the path of the righteous level. Mm -hmm. And a little further on, again, through the prophet Isaiah, in, in chapter 45, verse 2, he says, That he will make the rough places smooth. Now, I just got through saying, I mean, you know, there are bumps in life. Hallelujah, that's the truth. But God says he'll make the way smooth. I just, I remember a, a television advert in the United States in, a number of years ago, quite a number of years ago. And it was for one of the American luxury cars. I believe it was a uh, Lincoln. It was either a Lincoln or Cadillac. Mm -hmm. In this advert, they show the car going down this road, and it's a very, very bumpy road. I mean, the car's going to be... Tires are going up. Yeah. And they have a camera showing the tires going... Like that. Good but, sound effects. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to do it again. But inside the, the vehicle, they show a picture of a fellow in the back seat, and he's sitting there, and he has a glass of champagne, champagne, mm -hmm. and he's sitting there sipping the champagne while his driver drives, and it's nice and smooth and steady. I mean, you look at the bouncing, road, yeah. bouncing like crazy, and you look at him, what's, what happens? It's called shock, shock absorbers. Jesus is our shock absorber. Jesus is our shock absorber. Mm -hmm. he, he is the one who has taken. He's taken it all. The, upon himself. So he is fulfilling what, what Isaiah said he would bring. He would make the way of the righteous smooth. And it says in Psalms that he would take, he daily takes our burdens, carries our burdens. Amen. So, yeah, we all, we all go through tough spots. But understand that God has purpose in all of them. I mean, we had a discussion about this with a group just the other night. We were talking about, you know, the account of Joseph in the book of Genesis. Mm. Here's a man that God gave a vision. God had purpose in his life. And God was going to do something wonderful in his life. So he gave him a dream and showed him how his own family would bow down before him. Mm. So his brothers, in their brotherly love and, and their jealousy, <laughs> took him and threw him down a pit. Threw him down a well. But one of them saying, well, we don't want him to die. So they picked him up and they sold him off into slavery in Egypt. You got, I'm not going to go through the whole account. If you don't know it, please go to the last chapters of, of Genesis, Genesis. Sorry, what is it, in verse 41 or 42, somewhere around there. Go read it. He goes to Egypt, and he winds up finding favor with Potiphar, who is the chief of all of the bodyguards for the Pharaoh. And then his Potiphar's wife falsely accuses Joseph of attempted rape. That, by the way, was the first case that I know of, historically, of sexual harassment. In the workplace. It was, it was. It was sexual harassment in the workplace. Mm -hmm. A woman sexually harassing a man, by the right. way. Take, right. take note of that, okay? But through the whole story, I mean, the, the account is, and what matters is, that it was God, and this is what it says, it was not, it was not his brothers who sent him to Egypt, it was God who sent him to Egypt. And at the end, Joseph says to his brothers, you meant this for evil, but God meant it for good. 
What that means is all along, God had had a plan. It was God who was directing the life of Joseph. It was God who was leading him in paths of righteousness to a destination, to a destiny. There would be a blessing to the people of God through all time. So, you know, bear that in mind. This is why if you understand that, and if you know that, and if you trust that, mm. that indeed it is God who is directing your path, who is leading you on that narrow path to life, that then you will know that all, and this is what it says, we know we that know. all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose, yes. Romans chapter 8. So this is the assurance that you should have, is that God has you. The Lord has you in the palm of his hand where no man can snatch you out. Mm -hmm. That's, there's no better or safer place to be. And you know why? Because of your relationship with him. That's right. It's all about the relationship. It says in Psalm 43, you are precious in his sight. Therefore, he's given others in your place. He gave Jesus Christ in your place upon that cross to pay the price of your sin. And that's what Jesus is doing, is reconciling us to the Father. Yes. But I, let, let's just pick up again, because I want to I want to get into something and discuss it a little bit. And this is, let, let's say, this is a point of logic. Mm -hmm. Don't ever be afraid of logic. You know, God, who for whom nothing is impossible, nothing is illogical, because of his authority and power. So let's take Jesus Christ at his word, okay. right? Which, that's always a good thing to do, isn't always it? Uh, yes. In the broad spectrum of life, mm -hmm the majority will always be made up of people who have chosen the way that leads to destruction. Yes. And it will only be a minority who have chosen to enter the way that leads, the narrow way that leads to life. Yes. I mean, that's the words of, of the Lord. Yes, that's uh, what he said. So logically, you've got to accept that truth, right? Mm -hmm. Now, remember in John 14, 6, this verse, okay? Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Amen. So this becomes a poor advertisement for democracy. Mm, that's right. Choice is made by the majority. Yes. Now, if you just agreed with me that the word pretty much makes it clear that the majority is always going to go the wrong way, and it'll be a minority that chooses the right way, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And bear in mind what the Lord had spoken way back when, in the book of Exodus, when he said, You shall not follow the masses in doing evil, nor shall you testify in the dispute to turn aside after a multitude in order to pervert justice. Exodus 23, 2. You know, my mommy <clears throat> used to say to me when I was a little children, when I was a little child, she said, Well, if your friends went and jumped off the Empire State Building, would you go too? Well, the answer is I probably would have. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a fact, okay? Because I, like most, was a, was a lemming mm. and would follow the crowd over the cliff rather than be different. Now, God has healed me of that when I was born again. But that's simply the truth. It, the, the power of peer pressure is incredible. It is. And peer pressure is pressure indeed, all right? Just a little, a little education here. Solomon Ash, a psychologist at Swarthmore College who pioneered in social psychology, conducted experiments way back in the 1950s showing the power of peer pressure. The subjects, part of a larger group who were in on the experiment, were asked to answer a simple question. When following the purposely wrong answers of the participants, the subjects invariably followed their lead and answered contrary to what they knew to be true. Mm -hmm. In other words, and I, I use the example of one study that I looked at and studied years ago, was they, they bring in, uh, and this is on a college camp, campus, and they're being doing this experiment, so they had volunteers. They'd bring t 10 volunteers into a room, and they would look at a patch of a wall that was, um, I'm looking at a wall over there that you can't see right now that's bright really? blue. And they would say, okay, because this is, this is an experiment, we're trying to find out about color perception. Mm -hmm. So they said to the first person, what color do you see? And he said, that's, that's green. And the second person said, yes, that's green. And right down the line, nine people, it's green, it's green, it's green. And they got to the 10th person, <laughs> and actually the 10th person was the subject of this study. Right. Everybody else was in on it. Everybody else was in on it. Mm -hmm. And he looked at that blue wall, and he said, 
and, and it's green. Now, he knew that it was blue, but he was pressured by, by those others saying this. And that is the natural condition of fallen human beings. In 1961, psychology professor Stanley Milgram started experiments to determine people's willingness to obey, obey people in authority. Yes. Who required them to perform deeds that were contrary to their personal ethics. The large majority of the subjects did indeed do things that conflicted with their stated beliefs. People who are unsaved and unregenerate are lemmings. Yes. Or to put it as the Lord did, speaking through Jeremiah, every man is stupid, devoid of knowledge, every goldsmith is put to the shame by his idols, for his molten images are deceitful and there is no breath in them. Jeremiah 10, 14. Every man is stupid. Listen, that's the condition of fallen man. Adam was in that garden, had a perfect mind. Hallelujah. We come into new life, and you know what we have? An imperfect mind, which is why the commandment is, at that point, you've got to be renewed or transformed by the renewing of your mind. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, right? Now, I want to say something we're talking about. I, I think I just said something against democracy, huh? Be careful about following the Multitude. crowds, all right? The multitudes, yeah. right? The kingdom of God is a dictatorship. Yes. Pure and simple. Yes. Now, you may not like that because, you know, in the world we've been told dictatorships are horrible. Look at, I mean, Stalin, Lenin, Hitler. Well, they were. Well, they were, okay? Because of the word they had was not the word of God, not the word of love. Not the word all right? of love. We have a ben benevolent yeah. dictatorship. Yes. But everything in life, everything in the world, everything throughout eternity in the universe is based on one thing and one thing only, what God says. That's right. You would be in black, pitch black darkness right now had God not said, Open let there be light. Right. What he says is the rule, the rule of law, the rule of life. Put it any way you want. He's a dictator, a benevolent dictator. So now I'm going to go on to the next verses. In chapter 7 here in the Sermon on the Mount, 15, starting in verse 15. And Jesus says, now, now put this in context, mm. right? Many are going the wrong way. He says, beware, beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruit. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. That's very logical. Logic, I'm telling you. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by the fruits. That's the test. There's many, many false prophets out there. Check 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, all right? You know, test the spirits. Many yes. false prophets. Jesus, when he was asked by his disciples, you know, tell us what will be the signs of your coming in the end of the age. The first thing he says, you know, he warns against the false prophets, all right? False teachers, false anointeds, mm. right? 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. This is what Paul wrote to his son in the faith, Timothy. For the time will come where they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires. Who is the they that Paul is speaking of there? The church. Well, in, in a church, but the majority of mankind in general, those who are following the broad and easy path, which leads, of course, to destruction. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Specifically, he's talking about those who are, which is he also said in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Avoid such men as these. And as I said, Jesus in Matthew 24, he said, at that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Mm. Many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. Right? 
1 John 4, 1, the one I just quoted. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Mm -hmm. Test it. Test it. Test it. How do you test it? Like the Bereans. Search the scriptures to see whether it's so or not. Or another word, judge. That's right? what testing is. Test, judge. examine, yeah. discern. It all goes back to a godly form of judgment. Finding, not your judgment, but finding God's, God's judgment in the situation. All right? Yes. That's what you have to have. And it all comes back to, remember, we're doing Bible studies, but the goal of our instruction is love, Amen. Paul wrote. Love. When you're talking about these people, do they love you and the Lord mm. enough to tell you the truth? To expose your sin rather than tickle your ears. There's a test of a prophet. Yes. Listen, this is what it says in Lamentations 2.14. Your prophets have seen for you false and foolish visions, and they have not exposed your iniquity so as to restore you from captivity. But they have seen for you false and misleading oracles. False promises and sympathy will not heal anybody's spiritual ailments. Amen. That's the truth. That the the truth. purpose of exposing the iniquity is, is not, that, for healing. not that condemnation, mm -hmm. not judgment that's condemnation. It is judgment that is there for correction. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I just read a number of verses from 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy 3.16. It says that all scripture is God-breathed. It is profitable. It's profitable for correction. Yes. It's profitable for training in righteousness. Those are things that heal you spiritually. Okay? When it talks about, Jesus said you'll know them by your, their fruit. Well, their first fruit is love. Yes. That's what, that's what I'm talking about. And, and the, the rest second of the one, fruits are all connected. They are connected. The second one is joy. joy. All right? Does the joy that they claim to have and that they preach, does it come from a relationship with the Lord? Having his word or having the stuff of the world? You are to test them. Mm -hmm. And if they're preaching you that happiness and joy comes from the things that the world stuff. has to offer, then they're not preaching the relationship with God the Father. Yeah. And they are false prophets. In, in John 3, I'm going to read verses 29 and 30. Jesus said, He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him hears him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Yes. This is John the Baptist speaking. Right. So this joy of mine has been made full. He must increase, but I must decrease. Mm -hmm. If you're not hearing that message from where you're hearing messages, turn that message off. Test it. Try it. Because they're leading you on a broad way, an easy way, that leads to destruction. And Father, we thank you that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, into the world to lead us on that path of righteousness, that narrow way through the narrow gate that leads to life, life abundant. Father, we just thank you that he did for us what we could never do for ourselves. We thank you for the gift of your son, Christ Jesus. Well, time just zips on by, but we're glad that we could be with you this time. Until next time, God bless you. Bye. Till my trophies at last.